Hello everybody and welcome to today's youth gathering at 5pm. Ahead of us today we have a time of prayer, a time of song worship and a great discussion with some of you on racial injustice in the UK today, how it has impacted you and what the Bible says about it. Hello Roots, it's so good to be with you today and it's my privilege to be leading us in the prayer slot. And today in the prayer slot we're going to be focusing on the issue of racism and particularly at, at just what's happened to George Floyd and I've, I've been speechless about it for the past few days. I can't believe that someone would do that to someone just because of the colour of their skin and just, just shows how wrong racism is. But before we pray into this, um, we're just going to turn into our Bibles to Genesis verse one, chapter 1, verse 27. So if you've got a Bible, I'll give you a couple of seconds to turn to that now. So it says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. To me, this, this verse shows us how that we're all equal and no matter what we look like, every single one of us is made in God's image. And I think it's important when we deal with racism that we realise every one of us is equal in the eyes of God. And I personally think acts of racism break God's heart because when he sees people treating someone awfully just because of what they look like I really think it breaks his heart and it's just so wrong that as this verse tells us we're, we're all equal in God's eyes that we've got no right to treat someone differently just because they look differently and I think it's really important that we pray into this today and I've got two things I'd like to pray for so the first one, I'd like us to pray for the black community and particularly for George Floyd's family that they'd find peace and that also within the black community leaders will rise up and that all of them will know that they've got an army of people supporting them and most importantly they've got God with them. So. Secondly, um, I think it's really important that discussing this issue is that we pray for our leaders. It says in the Bible that we should honour our leaders and I don't know about you but particularly through coronavirus and then this issue now, our leaders are coming under real scrutiny and yeah we're not always going to agree with what they say but we do have a duty to honour them and I think it's really important that we pray for them now. Um, so I encourage you to pray for them to have wisdom and just pray that they just be aware that God's there as well for them. And
see you later. See
once darkness was our guide Without hope on only night We heard the call and turned to you Now the veil has been removed Cause Jesus we will throw away Jesus, you're so beautiful, you give vision to the blind. You and us, the hope of glory, in you we will abide. Though the body wastes away, inside we're renewed as you remain. The hope of glory forever. affliction of our days Cause Jesus we will throw away our lives to follow you Struggling in your strength and wrestling in your truth and Jesus you're so beautiful you give vision to the blind You announce the hope of glory in you we will abide for tomorrow, we fight through today. With energy, you path me word. We lift our heads and say, The mystery is known. Jesus, you're on the throne. Darkness is overthrown. Help us to make you known. to make you know to make you know ooh, 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 ooh. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Sunday. Um, today, we want to make our discussion about racial injustice um, in the world, but also in the UK. So we have gathered a really cool group. Um, we've got some amazing young people. Um, Michael and Mabinti are here as well. And we just want to, we've got a few questions, and we just want to have an open discussion um, about race, racial injustice in the UK and how it impacts young people in London and in the UK today and then discuss things that we can do going forward and ways that others can educate themselves. So I'm going to ask um, everyone on the panel to introduce themselves and um, we'll start with you Carol. My name is Carol Jackway, I'm 18 years old um, and I'm really passionate about fashion design and art. Cool, thank you. And um, over to you Maury. Um, my name is Maury Kessie, I'm a um, and I'm passionate about um, comics and writing and art. Nice. And Michael? My name is Michael and I'm 27 <laughs> and I'm very passionate about music. I'm Mabinti. Hi, my name's Mabinti Escher. I'm 31 and I'm really passionate about equality. Cool. And I didn't introduce myself. My name's Emma. I'm 33, and I'm really passionate about young people and kids, and especially empowering them, and especially um, pushing forward and encouraging young people of colour. Um, cool. So we'll start off with um, the first question: Is how are you all feeling? And um, this discussion and the protests have all stemmed from a really tragic murder of an unarmed black man in America called George Floyd. 
um, there's been so many discussions um, since then, loads of stuff on social media. How are you all feeling um, just within yourselves and in your hearts about what's happened? And um, Carol, if you'd like to open first. Um, I think at the moment I'm feeling a mix of emotions towards the situation. So like anger, confusion, disbelief, disappointment on what's going on and why there's so much racism in the world today. And that, you know, black people are are still are still being oppressed and are still being killed for no reason. Thank you. And um, Maury, how about you? Um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster because like I've been seeing a lot going on social media even before um, what happened to George Floyd. So I was kind of like really angry once I saw about George Floyd because it made me realize that it wasn't the only, he wasn't the only person that had been killed by police. And it made me kind of upset to think that there's still people who think of us differently. And Michael, what are your thoughts? Um, I go from being shocked to really, really sad because um, it's just, to me, it just seems so obviously unfair. But then I also have these moments of complete shock where I don't realize what it's like being a black person today and seeing the realities and understanding a little bit more each time. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just blown away at the kind of things that I didn't have to live with. Um, like like Michael, Maury and Carol, I'm the same. Um, I'm angry, I'm disappointed, I'm sad and I'm tired and I think I'm tired of being tired about race inequality um, and about racism. So and my emotions have actually affected the way in which I'm currently relating with God. Um, because I'm just tired of going to God with the same <laughs> with the same issue. So I think my overriding sorry, gone a bit over top, but my overriding emotion is tiredness. I'm abs I'm tired of being tired of being tired. Thank you so much. You really don't need to apologize. Like this is a real difficult subject. So um yeah, I think I I'd feel quite similar to you. I said to Michael earlier, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I was like, I really don't want to have this conversation because I feel like this has been quite a key conversation in my life since I was a child and recognised this and a teenager. And, and I think that's why I've become a youth worker. Um, but I think I had many tears over the last few weeks and just ups and downs of kind of disbelief. And, um, but I think there's a little bit of, little bit of hope I think this is the first time that I've seen um, people that wouldn't normally speak up about um, racial injustice speak up. Um, but at the same time, a little bit of me is like, oh, I wonder what life's going to be like in a few weeks' time. Will this just be a memory? Um, and yeah, will people have forgotten um, George Floyd's life and will it all be about the protest? Because I think it's important to remember that that's what happened that's what stemmed that's what it stemmed from um so our second question is how does george floyd's murder affect young people in the uk today so this one's especially for more and carol as young people um in the uk today and i guess specifically london but actually there are a lot of other diverse um cities in the uk um, but would one of you like to share about what, how it impacts you and how you've seen it impact your friends who are, who are black and also who are mixed race and who are not of colour? Um, so I feel like um, uh, young black people today, including myself, we often feel as though um, we have to be cautious or overly cautious about the way we conduct ourselves, you know, in public, at school, just in general social settings. Um, as some people see us, us see us see us as a threat, mm -hmm. um, and even when we are innocent, we are questioned for things we didn't do. Um, and I also think think that um, his murder has 
it has caused like young people to protest and fight, you know, fight for our rights and and um, and justice, um, and basically just because we want to change. And it's also it's also brought to light um, situations that situations that we experience that aren't fair. Um, you know, like not having equal opportunities and being told that you can't do something because you're black. Um, and even, you know, beside, beside being victims of white privilege and white supremacy and things like that, um, also the fact that our voice can't be heard in situations of injustice. So when he was on the ground and he was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, nothing was happening, they did nothing and it's just not fair. Oh, thank you. Um, Maury, would you like to share any thoughts? Yeah, um, I guess, especially for me, it was a realisation that everything's not okay for black people, especially, like, even in the UK, because, like, it, it feels a little bit more subtle, I guess, because, like, in my everyday life, I don't feel like I get, like, get it as bad as a lot of people do. But that's just my experience personally. But like seeing all my friends and people from school posting on social media it makes me feel not alone, I guess, because I'm seeing support from like people I never expected to see support from. And I guess for a lot of black people like me who live in London, it's kind of like knowing that you're not alone. You've got like your friends who see what you're going through. And then now like my friends probably realize that what I feel like every day or what I feel once in a while and they see like that my anger is not like irrational I guess. Mm. What do you think the effects are for young people living to because you work with young people um as well at church and at your church and you just you're just really passionate about young people and you've also done unconscious bias training with um, our young people so you know a lot about this topic how do you think it will impact young black people in the UK? I think it will take, um, I think this whole, the riots, um, the protests, sorry, and the death of George Floyd, I think it would really um, make, it would wake, wake us up, so to speak, wake young people up. I think it would, um, it would make them realise and like like um, Carol said, or I think it was Maury, that it's more subtle. Um, it's microaggressions in the UK. So it's little things like in school or college um, or university. Um, you know, the black man is the joker. You're the clown of the class. Little microaggressions, labels. Oh, you're so aggressive. Oh, you're so um, forthright. Oh, for women, you're so bossy. Oh, aren't you a bossy little madam? All these little microaggressions, I think, after this would wake y black young people up and they'll start to think, oh my gosh, I did experience that because of my colour. They did label me that because of my colour. They didn't label my white friend or my Asian friend that. They labelled me that. And I think it will cause a lot of post-traumatic stress um for a lot not just for young people for all black people actually um because it's like it's bringing up the wound again it's like the wound has um healed slightly and then this has brought it back up again um so i think it's a time where our young people may be confused um will be confused and we'll be asking why us why is it me? I'm just trying to get my A-levels done. I'm just trying to get to university. I'm just trying to come, um, I'm just trying to prove them wrong, prove these stereotypes wrong. I think a lot of anger as well make a lot of young black people feel angry, um, and rightfully so. Um, so I think in this, in this time, I think we'll see a lot of young black men and women coming forward and actually saying, fighting the fight or actually becoming fully aware of what inequality looks like not just in america but here in the uk as well yeah thank you so much um carol i loved um like your observation on what it was like for george floyd at the end like his voice wasn't even heard and the way that he was physically 
treated and Mabinti when you've reflected on uh, young black people stepping forward I've heard so many um, people stepping forward I was listening to a podcast this morning um, by two radio one extra BBC one extra DJs and they've been working on the BBC for ages and they were talking about how they've always had to felt like they've had to be a different person in that environment to to get through um, and I for me I think one of the th emotions that comes through is shame um seeing how um George Floyd is treated and then thinking like that's me I'm also black and for a young person to just feel so much shame because the, a lot of the feelings are so overwhelming because you have the expectation of other people of like how you're going to behave um and then um just kind of knowing that someone didn't value him enough and thinking is that how other people see me is that how my friends see me now just as Maureen said before and um, Michael as a youth worker as well and um, how do you think this is going to impact young people here in the UK and specifically um young black people um yeah I think it's it's, it's pretty hard for me to put myself in the shoes of young people young black people in London because I'm a white South African guy that grew up in South Africa but I was thinking about it and I wonder if for a lot of people if it's making a fear something that they're anxious about more of a reality like it's it's mm. given this realness because things are actually happening because of this unsaid prejudice that's going on um, and if that's yeah that's yeah that's really true yeah go ahead can I just add something as well? Yeah. I think there's also a feeling of helplessness. Um, there's also a feeling of, you know, because there were bystanders there who were saying to the police, you know, he can't, like, he can't breathe. He's telling you he can't breathe. Get off me. And they were not heard. So I think there's also a feeling for our young people of helplessness. What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I speak to? Um, I think. I think that is also running through their minds because a white ally could say, get off him. But if the police themselves or whoever is, um, you know, be it microaggression or being overt racism, whoever's being racist, it's up to them to actually carry out the act of not being racist. So mm -hmm. I think there's a sense of helplessness as well. Wow, thank you. Um, earlier I did a bit of a um, survey on Instagram and I asked a few questions. Um, one of the questions was, are you comfortable having conversations about race? Um, and 12 people voted, and nine said yes, and, and three said no. Um, do you each feel comfortable having these conversations outside of this space with family, with friends, with teachers at college or school? Um, I think that, um we feel as it's uncomfortable and it's very hard to talk about with people who are ignorant or don't want to listen but if we don't speak about it then people will not educate themselves people will not try to understand situations so that they can help um or even just show some respect mm -hmm. for black people and just towards everything that's happening so yeah, we do. We do need to talk about it. It it can be uncomfortable, but it has to be. Situation has to be addressed for it to, for us, for it to change and for us to move forward. Well, Maureen, have you got any thoughts on anything that has just been said? Um. Yeah, I, I agree. It might be um. A bit uncomfortable for people to talk about, but that's kind of the point. It can't be. It's not easy to talk about racism and the problems surrounding it because it's not fair and it's not right and I guess that's why people feel uncomfortable talking about it because they feel guilty mm -hmm. not knowing about it or saying the wrong thing and they're afraid of being offensive and that's normal that's perfectly normal you're allowed to feel anxious about it because even I feel uncomfortable talking about it sometimes because I'm worried I'm going to be seen as being too too like emotional or too angry about it. Just a thought. 
Um, would either of you guys like to share um, a story of when you've experienced racism? Um, so I, I read an article and the beginning of the article said that black children are exposed to discrimination the moment we enter the education system. Mm. And I feel, I feel I've experienced um, systemic racism. Um, and so this is like me, me and my black peers being in a classroom with 30 students and the teacher had put us to the back of the classroom and had basically segregated us from the rest of the class. And it was like we weren't even there. We felt that we were being ignored um, when we asked for help. I mean, eventually we got help, but it, it would take, I don't know, he would go around the whole room before he got to us. And it just felt like we didn't really care and we didn't feel supported. We didn't feel, we didn't feel as if we were being taught like everyone else. Mm. And so I just feel like sometimes, sometimes um, people don't realize what they're doing is offensive. They don't realize that it's racist or they don't realize that they are singling, singling us out. Um, and this is why I feel like education is so important and that I, I feel like, um, you know, like systemic racism and white privilege and these sort of things should be taught at school so that not, not just, not just for, it's not, it's not like um, a, a cry for help, but it's more to educate those around us so that, you know, white children, they can respect, they can respect black people and they can understand, understand how to act in certain situations and that they, they're just aware that, you know, we are, we are also people, we are not, you know, we are not, we are, we are no different to you. We, we are smart. We are, we, we have the ability to do the same things that you can do just because we have a different skin color does not mean we should have less opportunities or, or we should believe that we are not good enough to do something. And so that's why I feel like, yeah, it needs to be taught. It needs to be included somehow. Wow. And then thank you for sharing. And Maury, would you like to share a story? Um, I'll be honest. I don't actually know. Okay. I think, like, I think sometimes when I like, after the event has happened, I realize, oh wait, that was a bit odd. And there was something off about the interaction with that person, but I don't personally like remember that many instances, which I'm 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 glad for. But at the same time, it's sad because it's probably more subtle than I've realized. Mm -hmm. And so, like when I go on social media, I always see like people making jokes about black people or saying things. And then when I ask them, like why why are you saying this? What's wrong with us? They just I don't know, they just, yeah, they just sound so, like, they sound so confident in what they're saying that it actually scares me that mm -hmm. there's people out there that actually exist like that. So that's, like, but, like, I don't let those really, you know, bad eggs, like, like, cloud my judgment. But, you know, the, luckily I haven't had, like, an experience in person that I've really, like, that's really stuck with me today. Yeah, and can I just add that, you know, like the short the story that I shared, um, it at the, at at that time it seemed you know really big, but even I just think that obviously there are people who are going through more serious issues, um, and even though this is so small, it shouldn't be ignored because things like this are always happening and especially in like institutions um often you know like racist jokes and comments it just they just come and go but obviously it sticks with you because you felt it and they don't feel the pain because they are the ones saying like making the racist comments or the jokes and so even though even though it's like a small issue 
even though it's not as big as you know a black man being murdered for something he didn't do it's still racism and it should should still be addressed um Mavinti is shaking her head and I was thinking like that's not a small issue I was just going to say that because because Mavinti is going to explain why but um you know Carol like it's valid for you to feel like aggrieved by that segregating students in your class that's a racist act and that isn't acceptable and you have every right to feel angry and upset by that and you don't need to compare it with what someone else is going through um at that time so i'm really sorry that you went through that um Mavinti, you were like shaking your head or no. intentionally there so i wondered what you wanted to say <laughs> I was getting so like, no, Carol, it's not little, it's, it's, it's major because it happened to you. It's major because we're still talking about it. It's imprinted you. It's, it still affects you. It's affected you so much that you've brought it up today as an example. That is just, and the fact that you felt it was so small and you compared it to the death of George Floyd just goes to, like, oh, just goes to, affirm my sort of view in that how we in society are made to feel and how people can use these micro you know aggressive terms or micro aggressive actions passive aggressive racist actions and we will just think oh was it me oh was that oh i'll just brush it under the carpet and then we keep brushing these things under the carpet and then what happens is they may have not killed us physically they may not kill us physically but they're actually killing our spirits they're actually killing our souls <laughs> essentially because we're thinking you know what mm, maybe i shouldn't put my hand up in class next time maybe you know what i wouldn't ask for help i'll just sit i'll just sit at the back i'll i just you know i wouldn't rock the boat but in by doing that you are hurting yourself and they're hurting you you're not just hurting the, your ability to learn in the classroom because they're there to teach you but you're also affirming or saying to them it's okay actually for you to treat me like that and when you said earlier that what we should be doing is having these difficult con um, conversations and pointing them out and calling it out Sorry, sir, my hand's been up for like five minutes. I really need your help right now. Um, and I feel, maybe not in front of the classroom, maybe after, or tell your parents to send an email, but be like, mm, I feel like this in your classroom. This is what happened. This is how it happened. You move on. Call it out. I'm begging of any young person who's watching this that has experienced microaggressive racism, call it out there and then if you can't do it ask your parents to do it on your behalf but call it out because what then happens is we begin to um internalize these things we begin to internalize this we begin it we begin to see it as the norm and it's not the norm it's not normal <laughs> it's not normal to be treated this way so and it then brings up different mental health issues later down the line later down the line it brings up you know self-esteem low self-esteem you begin to question oh my gosh like i'm not worth anything my teacher couldn't even help me you begin to think things up that you know society makes you think so i'm just saying to you carol and anyone else any young person listening that if you experience any microaggression and sometimes there it's covered up by banter or it's covered up by <laughs> it was only a joke it's not a joke. If it was a joke, let me be in on the joke. It's, mm -hmm. I didn't find it funny and I'm calling you out. This is how it made me feel. End of story. So your feelings are not, your feelings are justifiable. And like you said earlier, call it out. Um, and it is equivalent to George Floyd, in my opinion, because it's affected you in some way. And that's just my, sorry, a bit passionate, but that's my point of view. No, it's fine. And, <laughs> and you know what, guys, like we're here for you guys. We've got your back. And if you want to talk through stuff that's happened or you want us to help you guys call stuff out, then that's what we do as like youth workers. We care about you in that way. And um, Mavinti, can you briefly explain, explain what a microaggression is for someone who, who might not know what that is? So a microaggression is like as people say, subtle 
things, subtle racial things, like for example, your teachers putting you at the back. You can't prove they put you at your the back of the classroom because you're black. They could just say, oh no, it's because you know of the seating plan, and you just happen to sit there. Is these are um, covert racial um, actions that cannot be proven. These, this is what we call microaggression. It's like they're little things that you cannot prove. If somebody calls you the N-word, you record it, you can prove they've done that. But if somebody um, puts you, like, for example, a teacher constantly ignores you, you can't prove that they're ignoring you because of your race. Um, but deep inside, you feel that way because they're giving all the attention to... Um, the white pupils, but not you, but you can't prove that. So that's what microaggressions are. And often people say microaggressions are, is banter or, you know, but this is how it always, this is what it used to be like, or, oh, but we've always called it this, or we've always said this, or, oh, it's all right. I can say this because I have a black friend or, um, that's a microaggression. <laughs> I can, you know, my next door neighbor's black. So it's all right for me to, you know, call you to say all black people love chicken. That's a microaggression and a stereotype. So, yeah, that's what they are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, yeah, so we're all Christians here. Um, and I think our faith is a big part of who we are. It's definitely a big part of who I am. Um, Mavinti and Michael, could you um, both reflect on um, what the Bible says about racism and, and justice? And which, Michael, would you like to go? Yeah, so I was thinking about this earlier. And I mean, there's so many verses that speak about, you know, there are no, like, you know, slaves and masters and, you know, Jews and Gentiles and all that. But I think uh, something that stands out above all of that for me is Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you don't understand what, who the Samaritans were to the Jewish people, they were a nation that were, divided like long time ago before Jesus told the story and Samaritans were seen as people who didn't worship God properly. They were like a different nation, a different people group and they were frowned upon because the Jewish people thought that the Samaritans didn't worship God. So they discounted them as like good people. So the parable of the good Samaritan is about this Samaritan who walks down the road and finds a person bloody and beat up and clothes torn and stolen and in the story, like two religious people from Jerusalem had already passed this man. But then a Samaritan comes, sees that he's in need, and he helps him. Um, and beyond just helping him, he takes him to an inn, a B and B or Airbnb, and um, pays for his bills, gives him everything he needs and more. And he tells the innkeeper, "Give him whatever he needs in the future, and I'll come back and pay his bill." And I feel like that, even though they may have had, this, had the same skin color back then, because there were different people groups, um, the, the fact that a Samaritan helped this person showed that there was, um, that he cared for him just because he was in need, not because he was the same person, but because there was a need and he had a way to meet that need. Um, and I think that speaks volumes um, about the situations we find ourselves in today. Well, thank you. And um, Vinti, would you like to share um, briefly your reflection on um, yeah, what the Bible tells us about racism and, and injustice? Yeah. Um, so, like Michael, I've been, I've been thinking about this, and yesterday I actually posted this up on my Instagram, um, just to say what the Bible says. Um, it's in Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. I'm just going to read it. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. So I think for me, that's, that's the scripture that resonates with me. Is, and this goes out and this, I hope this scripture is not, is not just um, exclusive to this event. It's for everything. Speak up for those in times when they are voiceless they're helpless and they need as a as they need our voices they need everyone's voices so the bible calls us to do that in my opinion so that's the scripture that i Thank go you. to um carol and maury would you like to 
reflect on oh, i'm trying to unmute you <laughs> um yeah carol would you like to both yeah carol go ahead <laughs> um do you want me to say a verse or like respond? whatever whatever you feel whether you've got a verse or have you got a verse um so there was a verse that i read um yesterday that i feel kind of um you know like depicts the situation so mm -hmm. it's psalm 64 um, I um is it quite long read it? yes could you please read it mm. so psalm 64 says hear my voice O god in my complaint mm -hmm. preserve my life from dread of the enemy hide me from the secret plots of the wicked from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords who aim bitter words like arrows shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast their evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see them? They search out injustice, saying, we have accomplished a diligent search, for the inward mind and heart of a man are deep, but God shoots his arrow at them. They are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues and turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads then all mankind fears. They will tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright exalt in heart. So I really feel like this, this um, verse is kind of, is kind of um, it, like explaining the situation. So it's saying that you know, we have a voice. We have a voice, we need to use it. And um, we are against the enemy. And us black people, we need to stand together. And even, even white people, we need to stand together and fight what is racism, racist people and people who are, are treating us differently. Um, but more importantly, we need to rejoice in the Lord. We need to trust and we just need to you know pray that he will protect us and that the evil in the world obviously we can't get rid of all of it but that he will yeah he will just protect us look out for us and that we just continue to pray you know pray over the situation pray that pray that you know there's a change happens and that it's not just it's not just for us to pray now we can pray now and things can start to happen but we need to continue to pray always for the things that are happening and the fact that black lives do matter they they have always mattered like there's no change in that and just because you know people are saying it now and because they're processing and because of the murder that's happened you know people are saying black lives matter but what about what about yesterday what about last year what about last week they they always mattered and so that's why i feel that this verse is is good for the situation oh thank you so much um maury would you like to share um yeah um so when i was thinking about this i like a few verses came to mind i don't remember the exact like the exact where it is exactly but um the first thing that came to mind was like Michael said, um, the the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. How, they, like, the, the Samaritan like looks beyond their differences and helps the person in need. Like they don't care about like anything, any differences they might have. It's just that they're in need currently, and that like stood out to me as something important we should all remember. Like we are like. Currently, black people are in need of support, like to feel safe, to feel like part of the community, and yeah. And also, what else came up to me was um, like God created us all in His image, not just a certain race. We are all one race, the human race, and that's that. That made me think that God loves us no matter the color of our skin. He loves us no matter what unconditionally and we should try and feel the same way towards other people wow 
Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and finally, our last question um, is each of us um, share one um, black person who really inspires you, someone who's doing something out there now that just really inspires and excites you. Um, Carol, go first. Um, so one person that really inspires me as well as many young girls today uh, is Michelle Obama. Um, and she has served as a role model for women and she has been an advocate for poverty awareness, um, health and well-being, education. Um, and I think she's an inspiration to a lot of people, um, not just because she's a powerful black woman, but also because she, she, you know, she encourages young girls to feel like they are enough, to feel empowered and to feel that you know even when even when they fall down that they can get up get back up and everything will be okay cool thank you um michael i'm going to break the rules a little bit and actually <laughs> change my answer from before because i've been thinking about it and honestly i think it's you emma what? um Aww. yeah with with working working with you and getting to know you and becoming <laughs> just really good friends with you you showed me how a black woman can absolutely love Rage Against the Machine <laughs> and do powerlifting and you've broken so many like bubbles and boxes that um yeah and I think it's really challenged me and with what you've spoken about and have been to in the past with having those preconceived ideas about what people are like by what they look like um and my relationship with you Emma has been like one of the biggest things that have helped me with that Oh man, you're so cute. Thank you. That's really nice. Um, <laughs> Mavinti. How am I supposed to go after that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> um, I'm going to say my friend. Her name's Kisha Igehi. Um, Igehi. And if I said it wrong, I'm so sorry, Keisha, if you ever see this. Um, but I'm saying Keisha because she started up a business called um, Imagine Me Stories. And in her business, what she's trying to do is diversify libraries. She's trying to um, diversify reading books for not just children of colour, but also white children. And um, so, yeah, so because she believes, like me, that representation matters. Um, and what she's done this month is she's um, not this month, like moving forward. She's going to donate one box to a school every month. Um, and I think that's just one step to inclusion diversity and inclusion um and so that you know young black children can read books and see themselves in those books and then when i got my first book the first book i got from her is jabari jumps um and my son was like oh my gosh that's me mommy and i was like if anything that has <laughs> that has made me feel so like wow just one little act can really change something so that's my person. Amazing. Maury? Um, my person is um, John Boyega. If you know him, he's in Star Wars. The, is it the newest Star Wars or the second newest? Recently, I've been seeing a lot of him on Twitter. He's been going out to the process with everyone else. And he's doing it with no, no worry about his career afterwards. Because, like, you know, a lot of celebrities tend to worry about what happens to them after they speak out. For what they believe in but he has no fear at all he's ready to lose it all for the sake of speaking out for his people and he's still unapo un uh, <laughs> unapologetic <laughs> about his views that's just so inspirational for me to see to know that there's someone out there like him who's like looking out for all of us wow thank you i felt it was important to ask this question actually i stole the idea from my sister um i was saying earlier that my nephew is nine has found this all quite distressing and she they sat down together and um she shows him and talks about those of black people that are excelling and doing really amazing things and so i think it's really important to celebrate um the amazingness that's going on as well and although i said this is the last question i did forget the last question which is um each of you one thing that um that should be a next 
step. You didn't say yours, Emma. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I had two. Um, One was a rapper, he's a British rapper called Shay Lingo. Um, He's a wicked rapper, but also he um, really speaks up about um, racial inequality and is doing lots of stuff to try and change the way that police um, restrain people. Um, and um, there was a guy called um, Julian Cole who um, research it. I'll put a link in. Um, but he, um, yeah, he really suffered, and he's a friend of his, and he's really been trying to be an advocate for him and his family. Um, and then my other person was a guy called um, Kirby Jean Raymond, who's a um, fashion designer in New York. And as soon as coronavirus um, hit, the pandemic hit him and his team, they just started making PPE without a concern for kind of like their own sort of revenue and their brand and um set up a um fund of money for artists who in this time would lose their would lose income um and yeah i just think that's amazing just such a selfless person who has integrity um so yeah just because time because of time one thing um that you would like to see happen next so it could be a practical thing or one thing for choose either one thing for someone who's watching and they're white and they're like, oh man, like, what should I do? Um, yeah, one, just one like tip each, um, starting with Maureen. Well, one tip that comes to mind is if you've been on social media, a lot of people are sharing links in their bios about what you can do. You can sign petitions, you can write emails, you can make phone calls, you can donate. You don't have, there's even YouTube videos you can watch if you don't have any, you don't have any money to donate. And the money from that, the ad revenue will go to um, be donated to people trying to help the cause. So there's a lot you can do even if you can't leave the house or you don't have enough um, money at, like currently. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid to do whatever you can. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be going on social media and posting 24-7 about it. You just have to do your own bit at home if you can. Thank you. Michael? Um, had to unmute myself. Um, I think as, as a white person, speaking from a white person's perspective, um, listening to the accounts and experiences of black people has been probably one of the most helpful things. Um, and I would encourage any other white people to do that as well. Um, cause the more, the more that I've realized how real the struggle is, the more it's moved me to want to do something about it as well. So if you want to be active, you want to do something, Start listening to the stories of people. Thank you. Moving to. Um, I'd say to all um, non-black individuals, um, be an active bystander. So, and by that, I mean, if you see something that you know doesn't look right, it might not be o- overt, it doesn't look right, and you see racism in any form speak up call it out there and then and we need active white allies at the moment we need your voice as much as ours um, in order to stop this in order to bring it down in order for us to live like in in unity essentially so we just need you to stand with us and be active bystanders call it out even if it isn't what you think it is or it isn't what it is still call it out check that person um Mm. so that they can check their biases as well should they need to amazing thank you carol um i think everyone has kind of mentioned most of the things but um also just educating yourself and people around you so Um, like Michael said hearing stories that you know like moved him to want to help more so even just searching it up or speaking to black friends um, or even just if you're not sure about something just searching on the internet just just so that you are you know like you're careful with your words and you know you, you don't want to offend anyone so yeah just educate Thank you. Yeah, I agree with everything you guys have said. I'd add, um, read. I have um, this book here, which has been, I haven't finished it. Um, but it's a brilliant book. It's really like easily written. And it talks about the way that and there's systemic racism in the UK. Um, and I'd say, have that conversation with your black friend. 
um, call them up and see how they are, not to appease yourself, but to find out how they are. Um, it might be awkward, it might be a bit messy, but just do it because, um, you know, any relationship that grows and has real, like, sort of substance, there's always going to be discomfort. You just push for it and you work for it together. So, um, yeah, cool. So, um, this is not the end of this discussion. This is something that as a youth ministry, we're definitely going to be trying to talk about a lot and trying to input things. We're going to be speaking to our church leadership. Um, and like, I definitely <laughs> don't stop going on about it. You can ask Michael. Um, and it's just something that's really close to our heart. And um, so if, you're, if you've been watching and you're like, oh, like this is frustrating, I'd like to change this in the church or anything, like please come and speak to us because we actually for real, like we're gonna, we wanna impact things and we want to help you guys grow in your relationship with God and to feel safe and welcomed and seen and heard um, at church. And um, who would like to close us in prayer? I'm, I'm happy to close off. Okay, go for it. <laughs> okay. Father God, I thank you that from your perspective, from the perspective of Jesus Christ, there is no black and white, there is no liberal and conservative, um, there's no rich and poor, but there's the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and there's a kingdom of darkness. Father, and I pray that, I pray against the injustice that happens everywhere around the world, whether it's in a rich country or poor country. Um, let us ask that by your spirit, you put it on, on our hearts to continue working against the things that are oppressing people um, and that by your strength we can achieve um, unity and compassion and love. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to say a special thank you to Maureen and Carol. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage to come out and, and to speak and so I thank you because I think you're really going to have an impact and your peers will really value you and I think it's really courageous. So thank you so much for putting your heart into this and for willing, being willing to give your time. We really, really, really appreciate you and we love you. And yeah, we think you're awesome. So thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.